very happy to introduce to you Dr. Rustin Moore, DVM, PhD, and Dean, the 11th Dean of the Ohio State College of Veterinary Medicine. Now, the college was founded in 1885, so deans have a fairly long tenure. <laughs> He's from West Virginia, undergraduate degree summa cum laude from the University of West Virginia, then DVM at Ohio State, summa cum laude, then a PhD at Ohio State in equine gastro, gastrointestinal <laughs> physiology pharmacology. So, Stomachs of horses. The first time I met him, my mother-in-law died two years ago, and he had been appointed dean in July 2015. She died in September of 2015. She had been a faculty member of the College of Veterinary Medicine for about 20 years, but had been retired for over 20 years at the time that she died. At her memorial service, Dr. Moore comes, unbeknownst to my wife and I, and asked if he could say something. And we obviously we said yes. And he got and when he spoke at her service, he said that my mother in law, who is a biostatistician, got him through his PhD, helped him with all the statistics on his research, that he didn't think he could get it, that he didn't think he would have done nearly as well <laughs> had he not had her as his advisor. And this was totally unexpected. And it's one of those things that shows the humanity that this man has besides all of his professional accolades. And from that point on, I was a fan. And I'm so glad now today that he has the opportunity to speak to us. So without further ado, give a rotary welcome to Dr. Rustin Moore. great honor to be here and uh, really appreciate the kind invitation to come. Um, I actually said uh, a lot more at uh, Gene Powers' uh, memorial uh, than what Steve shared, but certainly that was uh, true. Uh, she did more, helped me with more statistics than probably uh, any other person she's ever helped in terms of a PhD because there was a, <laughs> there was a lot of data uh, and just a, a kind, dear lady. Um, so let's see if we can make this work. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, uh, Columbus Rotary for inviting me. Um, didn't anticipate this many people being here. And I did read, I should have read a long time ago, I read that this might be videotaped. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, so uh, hey, I'll go with, along with the flow. This is just a brief outline of some of the topics that I'm going to uh, cover today um, and try to go through it in, a, in time that we have time at the end for questions. I thought the best thing to do would be to start with a, a, um, a video. Animals. We are awed by their diversity and inspired by their beauty and intelligence. We are touched by their tenderness and amused by their antics. We rely on them for food, for work and transportation, for therapy, and for companionship. We are nothing like them, and everything like them. Animals and people. Our histories and our futures are inextricably linked, a fact understood and advanced by the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Founded in 1885, the college is ranked fifth in the country by U.S. News & World Report. 85% of Ohio veterinarians graduated from Ohio State. More than 7,000 alumni practice in all 50 states and in 40 countries around the world. The college works to keep the world's food supply secure and safe and supports agriculture, Ohio's leading industry, by protecting animal health and productivity. Its research produces medical breakthroughs and therapies that benefit both animals and people including the commercial success of the feline leukemia vaccine and recently diagnostics for tick-borne diseases. Exciting advancements like these made the Veterinary College Ohio State's leading producer of commercialization revenue in recent years. The college's Veterinary Medical Center provides expert care to thousands of animals each year through its Hospital for Companion Animals, Hospital for Farm Animals, and the Galbraith Equine Center. With more than 27,000 patient visits annually, 
the Hospital for Companion Animals is undergoing a critical expansion and enhancement project, funded entirely by private donations. Ground was broken in the fall of 2014 for phase one of construction that includes a state-of-the-art intensive care unit followed by advanced surgical facilities, plus a larger, more comfortable lobby and waiting area for patients and their owners. Ohio State is the only university with seven health science colleges on one campus. Faculty collaborate across all health disciplines and with hospitals, including nationwide children's, to advance medical research and care. Many diseases, including cancer, behave the same in humans as they do in animals. The college operates one of the nation's largest clinical trials offices to advance treatment of naturally occurring diseases in animals. People benefit from these research efforts as well. In the next decade, 70% of new emerging infectious diseases will be zoonotic, starting in animals and moving to people. This puts veterinarians on the front lines of surveillance and prevention to protect against disease outbreaks. The Ohio State College of Veterinary Medicine has taken a leadership role in the One Health Initiative, aimed at developing collaboration among the many disciplines dealing with human health, animal health, and the environment. Other global public health issues, such as the sustainability of the world's food supply for more than 7.5 billion people, and the impact of climate change, have an animal health component that must be addressed. The challenges that lie ahead are many. The interaction necessary among health professionals today requires reinventing how science and medicine are taught and practiced. The Ohio State College of Veterinary Medicine, its faculty and staff have pioneered these efforts. For more than 130 years, the college has advanced the field of veterinary medicine. It is a leader for today and tomorrow. Okay, so you heard the, one, the term One Health in there, and I just want to uh, start by saying that's a, a term that really uh, talks about the inextricable link between animal health, human health, and the environment. And although I could probably stand up here and lecture all, all day on, on that topic, I just want to introduce the idea that veterinary medicine plays a central role in that One Health arena uh, within that triad of animal, human, and environmental health. And I hope that you, you uh, learned something uh, from that short video about what a College of Veterinary Medicine does and contributes uh, more so than just uh, what a lot of people think, which is that we vaccinate puppies and kittens. Uh, we, do, we do a lot of that, but we do a lot more. So <clears throat> as a veterinarian and as a scientist, I, I think of uh, One Health as what I refer to as the three Zs of One Health, and you heard one of those terms in the video. One of those is zoonoses which are those infectious diseases that spread between animals and people. And, and in fact, uh, there's about 70% of those diseases, things like Zika, SARS, Ebola, and many, many others uh, who, that emerge or reemerge, actually start in animals and spread to people. Zubiquity is, is really, you can read the, the definition there, but it's really a fancy word for comparative medicine, which means, uh, in my mind, animals and people get the same diseases. We, we get cancers that behave very similar, we get heart disease, we get diabetes, uh, and what we can learn in veterinary medicine and what physicians and other scientists learn in people can actually help uh, and cross over back and forth between the two. And the third one is uh, zoea, and we'll come back to that uh, uh, a little later. So really we're gonna get to the, to the meat of, uh, or the center part of, of this uh, presentation, which is called The Power of a Pet. This is a more expanded version of the of one I gave actually as a, as a TED Talk. And so I think it's important to understand the, uh, uh, some of the demographics. So I'd like to start by asking how many of you here either grew up with, have had, or currently have a pet? Okay, better do the other way. How many have never had a pet? So I don't see anybody. So actually over 70% of Americans have at least one pet or companion animal. And actually three quarters of, uh, uh, of children uh, are more likely to live in a household with a pet than they are with their biological father or siblings. And to me, that's a stunning statistic. Also, uh, seven and eight-year-old children rank pets higher in terms of providing comfort, self-esteem, and serving as confidants than, than people or their families, which again uh, speaks uh, to the importance of the pet. Uh, I always like this quote by George Eliot, animals are such agreeable friends, they ask no questions, they pass no criticisms. 
and um, you'll talk, hear me talk a little bit about some of our outreach programs later, and I think this is really important when we talk about what we do in the community for homeless and others that are less fortunate. So I uh, grew up in rural West Virginia, and yes, this is me way back in the day, and I've had a multitude of animals uh, and cared for them over uh, my career, but certainly since becoming a veterinarian, I've, I've treated countless animals, and uh, I was uh, an equine surgeon, horse surgeon, until I became an administrator. And so there was one uh, pet in particular or patient that really sticks out in my mind that I want to share a little bit with you. So this pony, uh, her name is Molly. She actually uh, was in Louisiana. I was in LSU for 12 years. And Molly was uh, in a, a barn during Hurricane Katrina. Uh, a tree fell into the barn, and actually not just into the barn, but into her stall. Fortunately, she was not injured. Uh, about 10 days later, she was rescued, uh, adopted, and taken to a nearby farm. That's, not, that's where the story sort of stopped or started. Uh, a few months later, a dog on the farm attacked her, and uh, the crush of the bite of the dog around her ankle, or for those people who know horses, fetlock, uh, crushed the blood vessels to the lower part of her leg, and she lost her foot due to lack of blood supply. So her veterinarian, who I knew well, called me and said, what do you think about doing an amputation and fitting this pony with a prosthesis? And I, I can remember I was driving when I, was, when I got this call. And uh, I was thinking, I was sort of going along with it, but thinking, nah, we're not, you know, we're not doing that. But I, I, uh, much to hell Steve said, I usually, um, you know, I, I listened and so I agreed to see the patient and the owner uh, the next day. And we talked and I said if um, I need to watch this pony for a couple of days in the hospital to see if it's the right, if she has the right demeanor. And I can just say that actually this pony is the one that convinced me if there was ever a patient to do that on, uh, it would be this one. And it's the only one I've ever done an amputation and a prosthesis on. So I'm batting a thousand and I'm not, I'm not going any further. So. This is her now, uh, th this picture is older, but sh uh, she's still going strong. Uh, uh, the surgery and, and, uh, and the prosthesis uh, was about 12 years ago. Her purpose in life has certainly changed. She now travels, a uh, little less now because of her age, but for many years traveled around quite extensively, including to uh, the Walter Reed Army Medical Center uh, to visit uh, veteran amputees uh, all over uh, several states, including she's been in Columbus twice. Building, um, visiting children's cancer camps, elder care facilities, veterans, and, and other types, uh, really um, sh showing them that they can have, this is how I view it, uh, that she can ha uh, have uh, courage, but more importantly, that it's okay to look and to be different, and that you still serve a useful purpose in life. I'll never forget the confident smile on this young boy who was at a cancer camp, and uh, there's a video of him too, actually, you could Google it, um, you know, he had just had an amputation for bone cancer not that uh, long ago, but there's a, a picture of him at the end, uh, I think, riding a skateboard and just uh, a big old smile on him. And this uh, veteran amputee over to the right, uh, this was at an elder care facility that we visited. I was watching this gentleman who was pretty subdued, pretty complacent, not very engaged until this pony walked over to him. He nearly leapt out of the wheelchair, grabbed her, hauled her by both straps, pulled himself up and kissed her, um, which, again, this is the first time he'd interacted with that pony, and so I think that just sort of showed to me the power and importance of the human-animal bond. And there is actually um, a lot um, of research that's done around the, the power and importance of that, and it's really a dynamic, mutually beneficial. There's studies that show positive benefits on both the person and the animal in terms of uh, things like blood pressure going down, heart rate going down in both animals and people. Uh, when they're together and certainly could go on and on about some of the research but for uh, purposes of time I won't. So I met these two individuals, Bev and um, Roy, about two years ago. They are here in uh, uh, homeless camps. They both have pets and um, I asked them uh, because they, they were in camps because they couldn't get in shelters or other housing because they had the pets. So I asked them uh, in a nice way, and knowing what the answer would be probably, uh, so why don't you just give up uh, uh, Tigger and Boo Boo so that you can get off the streets and get into housing? They both, uh, and this was in separate conversations, uh, almost identical words said, 
I can't give up Tigger or Boo Boo. That would be like giving up a member of my family. Uh, and that's really the, the, the role uh, these animals play, not just in the homeless, uh, but certainly in probably everyone out here who raised their hand. They have really, over the last 30 years, uh, we, there's, we've seen a humanization of animals, and they've become a member of our families. So zoea, uh, if you think back to that third Z, zoea is uh, a term that's been coined for the research evidence that's been developed and continues to develop on the positive health benefits of interacting with an animal or pet on people. And that's uh, everything from behavioral, social, physical, emotional, mental, and psychological health. And uh, hope my goal here today is to briefly um, convince you, which I don't believe it'll uh, take that much convincing, that, that actually uh, this something is something that's very important. So you're probably thinking, uh, show me the proof. And so I'm going to uh, quote a few statistics, and then I'm going to sh uh, uh, show a few examples. So basically, there is a, a wide variety of research out there that shows things uh, of interacting a pet on people, th such as decreased cortisol, which is a stress hormone, decreased triglycerides, decreased cholesterol, um, uh, uh, weight reduction, uh, increase in a, in a hormone called oxytocin, which is a feel-good hormone, and much more. And actually, uh, it's been said that a, a pet, or particularly a dog, is a, a conversation waiting to happen. Uh, if you take a dog on a walk, you're going to meet your neighbor. If you haven't met your neighbor in five years and you get a new dog, you'll meet your neighbor uh, and you'll start developing relationships. The other important thing is think about the cost of, of, um, uh, of, of health care. There's a study that's been shown recently that uh, people who have a dog uh, there was a 12, over a $12 billion health savings of people with a dog just from reduced physician vis office visits compared to those who didn't. And that's just the tip of the iceberg in my mind, that there's that kind of uh, positive health benefit, but also decrease in health care costs uh, of interacting with animals. Now, I'm going to talk about three of uh, particular ones, uh, autism spectrum disorder, um, Alzheimer's and then post-traumatic stress syndrome. So autism spectrum disorder, I think most people probably know what that is, but it's a complex developmental disability that manifests early in childhood and it can have a whole continuum of, of signs, but really it's, it's about communi uh, inability to communicate uh, and interact socially uh, compared to uh, others. And the Center for Disease Control Prevention ha has shown that one in 68 births in the United States uh, uh, will develop some level of autism in one in 54 boys. Uh, and so you might say, well, what uh, could a pet do in this uh, sort of situation? And, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll share that. I, I would imagine that most people in this room either uh, have directly known or indirectly known someone uh, affected by this, uh, this, uh, this um, disorder. So I want to uh, show you this, and, and I don't know that you can read it from way back there, but this is actually a, a letter written by a 14-year-old boy who had been in a correctional facility in Marysville, Ohio, uh, and was being treated for physical, emotional, and learning challenges. Uh, the boy was given the task of training an abandoned uh, dog named Oswald so that this dog could become adoptable. So this is what he wrote. Oswald is lovable. <laughs> because he likes hugs, he really is nice, and he, look, he like kids. Oswald looked like a fuzzy bear, he play really nice, and he run really fast. He does not bite, and Oswald is like six years old. Oswald need a family because he need a lot of love. Oswald is fun to play with, and he need a family that care at him. He loved to be around people. Oswald is funny, and Oswald is a dog that listens to rules. <laughs> now, I think this is, uh, it's pretty ironic that this boy wrote this when he was 14, an autistic child, and, and, and identified things about this dog that this dog needed to become adoptable and have a successful life. And every one of these things are things this, this child did not have growing up. And that those things were family, love, fun, being around people, and having a set of rules to follow. But this, this, uh, this experience with this dog really did impact this, uh, this child and gave this child a, a chance for a better life. And this is just one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the human-animal bond. So Alzheimer's and dementia, I think everyone's familiar with that. Over five and a half million people in the U.S. have uh, Alzheimer's and millions more have other types of dementia. 
And actually, some of the same things that apply to people with autism uh, apply to people with Alzheimer's in terms of the impact uh, of animals. So one of the things that, that animals do, particularly dogs, uh, they offer companionship. And one of the things they, uh, that, uh, you know, they're loyal, they're dependable, they're non-judgmental. They don't care what you smell like, what you look like, uh, how much money you have, uh, any of those things. But they also, dogs in particular, are natural born listeners. So, you know, people talking to a dog, and I talk to my dogs too, uh, and the dogs just sort of look at you and act like they're listening and understand. So that's one of the things. And then also, animals have been shown to reduce anxiety, uh, aggressive behavior, uh, and agitation. So as you probably know, people with dementia and Alzheimer's do get agitated because they can't remember and other things. And being around dogs uh, or pets certainly helps him. Now this is Alan. Alan was in, this is when he was 78 years old. He was in a study that was being done uh, by Ohio State looking at the impact of interacting with horses on uh, cognitive, behavioral, and other types of uh, skills. And uh, Pretty much every day, uh, he would ask three questions. When can we go see Jack? That's the horse's name, Cactus Jack. Can I ride Jack? Can I have Jack? And that went on pretty much every day for the whole summer that this project was going on. Well, four years later, on his 82nd birthday, you can imagine what three questions he asked. Uh, so he remembered, and you, this is just to me another example of the power of the human-animal bond, regardless of age or mental capacity. The other thing I want to mention, going back, is that um, to show the strength of that bond, uh, certainly you saw Bev and Roy and the fact they wouldn't give up their pet uh, to get in housing. But most of you probably know that women, uh, primarily, in situations of domestic violence, if there's a pet in the household, they oftentimes will not leave the, the household for fear of what will happen to the pet. And most shelters, uh, will not allow pets, uh, and so there's a real conundrum there. Fortunately, there are programs in Columbus, including a program called Safe Haven, that helps with that, but that just demonstrates to me the power and strength of that bond. So po post-traumatic stress syndrome, I'm sure most of you know what that is as well, but basically it's a, it's a condition that can actually occur after any type of traumatic event, whether it's a terrorist attack, a severe accident, a physical or sexual assault, uh, certainly military combat, uh, and, and other things, and what's been shown is when uh, veterans, oh, actually between 8% uh, uh, of the U.S. population and up to 30% of veterans returning will develop PTSD sometime during their lifetime. To me, that's a pretty staggering number. And, and really, you might say, well, how, do, how would a dog help? It's been shown that veterans returning who are paired with dogs have better relationships, they have uh, less severe signs of PTSD, they require fewer medications and lower dosages of medications and have less substance abuse than those not paired with a dog. And, and these are scientific studies, you know, so th there is evidence, again, that helps this group of people. So this is Ryan. Uh, Ryan uh, is the one to the right, uh, a little shorter. Uh, and Ryan is currently a third year student in our College of Veterinary Medicine. And I got to know Ryan uh, actually indirectly by reading his uh, personal essay during the admissions process. And then once he was admitted later, I got to know him. And so like me, he uh, was born in West Virginia. He had a dog named Jim that he had uh, for several years. And it was actually when uh, Ryan was 17, he lost his dog, which was really the first real loss and thing of grief he had to experience. He had always wanted to be a veterinarian, but you know, when you become 17, 18, you start then thinking about adventurous things. So he decided to uh, join the, the Army. And so he very quickly after enlisting uh, got deployed and into a combat zone where he was severely injured and got and uh, actually retired with, uh, from the military with, uh, with um, uh, medical, uh, it was a medical retirement. And not only did he um, have that that medical issues he actually had a, uh, was diagnosed with PTSD and, and was struggling uh, for some time and it was actually um, he, his mother was watching him struggle and decided to get him um, a uh, minute or a, a, a great Dane puppy uh, that he, uh, at the time was small <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, he got it and he named this puppy Izzy uh, 
Uh, and this is what he wrote in his essay. This dog saved my life. It amazes me how the bond we developed brought me back to life. Izzy got me through some difficult times. So un like, unfortunately, like all dogs and all people, <laughs> we, we all have a, a certain lifespan, and, and Izzy died. And actually, Ryan's roommate noticed him slipping backward uh, with regard to his PTSD and suggested to Ryan, maybe we should go look for and get you another dog. And so at some point, they decided to do that. They went out, they found another Great Dane puppy, and ironically and appropriately, he named it Maybe. And this is Maybe, and you can see Maybe is a small Great Dane puppy, but will grow up to be, has grown up to be a big puppy, a <laughs> big dog. And so I think it's really important that to, to point out that if anyone uh, is going to get a pet, uh, they should consult their veterinarian or someone to make sure the right pet uh, is gotten for the right situation, whether it's where you live, whether you have small children, whatever it may be, so that those positive benefits can actually uh, be shown uh, rather than having some of the, some of the negative ones uh, come through. Um, the other thing that's been shown is not, you don't have to own a pet or be around it all the time to reap those benefits. So if you can't have a pet, you can go to a shelter and walk a dog. You can visit your neighbor who has a pet. You can visit your family who has a pet or any other uh, interactions that are intermittent have some of those uh, same uh, positive benefits. So the real question is what can we do? Well, uh, armed with the information I've given you and certainly from your own experiences, there's, there's several things we can do. Um, we can all tell our family and friends about the uh, positive health benefits um, and there's a lot of, as, as I've shared a little bit, there's uh, certainly scientific data to support this. Uh, each of us can talk to our healthcare professionals uh, it is my view that if someone goes into their doctor and someone on a healthcare team does not ask, do you have a pet, they are making a big mistake. Because um, if, if you saw 100% here, at least 70% of them have a pet, most people f uh, consider that pet part of the family. And if, if asked about a pet, it sort of starts to break down sort of the, the barrier. Uh, there's, there's better trust and they are more likely to share information about themselves that will help the physician or the healthcare team help them with their, their uh, healthcare needs. Also, uh, there's been evidence shown that uh, if you incorporate a pet into some part of the, the treatment plan or, or wellness plan, that will also increase patient compliance on the part of the human. Uh, so if, if you think uh, that person might need to do some walking for whatever positive health benefit, suggesting taking a dog walking. Uh, point is, they'll do things for their pets that they won't do for themselves, um, and, and that's, that's, that's true. We can also heighten awareness among all healthcare professionals regarding the value of incorporating a pet into that uh, plan. And so if, if, if people don't ask you uh, or your loved ones about do they have a pet, uh, make sure you say, I have a pet, and the pet's an important part of my life, because that, again, is something that's really important in the, in the health of that person. And we can also encourage physicians to <clears throat> prescribe pets. And so that brings me to this. I was given this prescription uh, about two, three years ago, actually right as I was becoming dean, to adopt two black miniature schnauzers and spend at least 10 minutes with them as needed to lower stress and anxiety. Um, so I took that advice, some of the best advice ever. Um, these are my two dogs. Uh, Travis Lincoln and Teddy Luther, and you can see they're Buckeye fans. Um, and so I, I think uh, the, the thing about this is they both, uh, I can tell you, uh, and, and I've had animals and pets all my life, but not, I hadn't had one for 22 years because I'd been working hard and traveling, and um, they really uh, have changed my life from the standard priority. Uh, I know now that uh, I could easily stay at work or go straight to work to some event uh, before, but now I have to go home and let let them out, feed them, take care of them. And so it does sort of reprioritize your life and also has decreased uh, stress and anxiety. So uh, how are we doing on time? Okay. So I just wanted to touch base. Uh, there's, there are a lot of colleges uh, at Ohio State, at least seven of the 15 that are doing work in the area of, of zoea or this human-animal bond. I'm not going to go through that. What I really want to focus is on what we're doing in the community. So we started an outreach medicine program back in 2009 where we were one day every other week going out to homes served by Life Care Alliance and meal, for Meals on Wheels, providing veterinary care to the pets of those homebound, elderly, um, 
you know, people who the pet was the most important thing in their life. They're, they were isolated and the pet was providing them the companionship. What we learned during those is not only uh, were the pets in need of health care, uh, they were in need of food because the, the people were actually feeding their meals to the pets, not eating. So now uh, Meals on Wheels does deliver pet food to those homes uh, that have pets and, and that's something that our veterinary team discovered. Uh, and now we've gone up to four days a week doing uh, outreach. We not only do, do Life Care Alliance, you can see those other organizations, Faithful Forgotten Best Friends and others where we provide veterinary care. Our fourth year students are providing the care under the supervision of a faculty member. Um, and so they're learning uh, important clinical skills, but the most important thing I think from this is they're learning about uh, civic awareness, community service, um, cultural competencies. They would, our students would never encounter these people that they're serving uh, in our hospital because these people don't come to our hospital. Uh, and these, these experiences, these experiential learning experiences, when you read the comments from the students, they're, they're life changing. So I'm going to skip through couple of these uh, for, for time. Uh, we also have a shelter medicine program that started in, in the mid-90s. We were the first college to vet med it was actually there's 30 colleges of veterinary medicine in the U.S. There's only one in Ohio and we're the second oldest of all in the U.S. We're also the largest, uh, most alumni and the most, the, the most students. But we started this program back in the mid-90s and, and we were the first also to become to make it a mandatory requirement for a two-week rotation in every student's fourth year rotations. Uh, and they get tremendous experience in spay, neuter, and other things that really helps their skills, but it's also giving back to the community. And we, we did that with Franklin County Dog Shelter for many years, and uh, 10 years ago switched to Capital Air Humane Society, uh, which is now called Columbus Humane, and I'm sure many of you are aware of that. So I just want to play this, uh, this video quickly. This video is our students by themselves twice a year schedule what used to be called Oath in Action Day uh, and now it's called Day of Service. It's really hard to give a dog a sweater when the person has no coat. It's really hard to uh, hand them dog food knowing that they don't have any food. We all do things that are outside of our mission to help these people. The Faithful Forgotten Best Friends is a 501c3 nonprofit. It was founded five years ago, and its purpose is really to help the animals of the homeless and the low income people here in Columbus. We're able to make sure that the animals vaccinated and that they're fixed and that they're healthy. That's the big thing, that the animal's healthy so the person knows when that opportunity comes, their chances are really good of getting in. We've built up years of relationships with these people. We've, we've seen their animals come in and uh, we've seen them flourish. That animal loves them unconditionally and the folks are really they take good care of their animals. They really care about, they walk great distances to get here with those pets. My name is Elvin Wells, and this is my fiance, Donna, and our dog, Angel. I got her from my niece, so we took good care of her for the last month and a half, and she's been in our life, she's been a joy. We came today to have her uh, looked at and find out what we need to do and they graciously took care of all the shots. And the nurses and techs have all been great. Hi, my name's Connie. I'm 49 years old. This is my cat, Bubby. He's six years old. He's the best cat in the world. I want to I wanted thank Connie, the, the, the founder of this program, and everybody that, that volunteered. You know, a lot of people can't afford to get their cats fixed or get them shots and stuff. And these are just like our children, you know. And uh, without this, we wouldn't be able to take care of our animals the best way we possibly can. So many of these people here today, they are willing to put their own health and their own needs aside for what their animals need. And I think that's something literally every single person can learn from, is just being really selfless and taking the time to 
care about someone else or an animal or the environment, whatever it is that you might be passionate about is be a little less, a little selfless and go out and volunteer or I, that's a huge lesson I think I really took home from today is just get a little less centric and really project and open myself up to new people and new opportunities. Like I said earlier, just seeing how happy these people are makes me, I would give up a weekend or a day just to maybe do this a few times a month because it's the whole point of being a veterinarian is getting to see the smile on these people's face when you're able to provide for their animal. And I'd definitely do this again. Uh, this is Cotton. He loves to eat gravy. <laughs> so that, I'm going to uh, conclude on that because that's a, a, an emotional video. I'd like to uh, say, uh, certainly I'll take any questions if there's time. I uh, also would like to say that um, if you, there's my contact information. Uh, if any of you or as the group would like to, like to come for a behind the scenes tour of the Veterinary Medical Center and or, and or college, mm -hmm. I would certainly uh, uh, be honored to give you uh, that tour. Uh, we might have to break it into groups because there's quite a few, but uh, we can certainly do that. So uh, I don't know if, if there's time for a question or. Well, we, we've kind of run out of time, okay. but if you'd stick around, I'm sure, sure. there's some questions Absolutely. we could take. Thank Great. you, Dr. Moore. Thank you, Dr. Moore, for coming today and also for researching this these important topics. Uh, I think we all feel what he talked about, but uh, to have it actually quantified and studied is very important. So uh, thank you all for coming today. I hope you join us again next week. We will have Dr. Roy Stein, and he's going to talk about uh, the problem of invasive species in the Great Lakes. Thank you. We'll see you then.